Okay. All right. Hi, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to Sierra Astronomy Live. Um, we'll be getting started in just a little bit with our warm up trivia round. Um, I want to let just a few more people um, get connected to uh, the, the trivia app. So what you're going to do if you want to play along uh, with the trivia is go on your cell phone to menti.com and type in the code 25. 839156. So you can see that code at the top of the screen here. And once we get a few people signed into the trivia, we can go ahead and get started. All right, I mean, I'm seeing some, some hearts coming through. So some people are logging in at least. We'll give it maybe just another minute or so, and uh, then we'll go ahead and get started. So uh, you can join the trivia at any point. Um, score is just for fun, so uh, no prizes or anything. Um, just honor and glory, of course. Uh, but uh, certainly don't don't feel like if uh, if you're having trouble getting the code in or something um, that there's no reason to join. So please, please feel free to join halfway through. Um, again, to to join in the trivia, you're going to go to menti.com and use the code at the top of the screen. That is 25839156. And uh, I think with that, we will go ahead and get started with the trivia. All right, so clearly this did not get reset. <laughs> Great. One moment, my friends. Trivia is coming right back to you. All right. OK, we're back. And moving to the first question. All right, so it's going to it's really going to do this to me. Huh? Yeah, all right, so. I, I seem to have broken the trivia. Clearly, we did need to practice this. So, um, <laughs> one moment while I fight with this. No, I want to reset the results. Oh, all slides. That's what I didn't click. Okay. Is this going to work this time? Yeah, here we go. All right, I, I knew there was a screen missing. <laughs> okay, welcome back everybody. Some technical difficulties, but now you should be able to sign in, uh, get uh, with the code 25839156 at menti.com. And we'll actually be playing some trivia this time. Thank you for bearing with me. Yeah, see, this is what I remember. Lots of fun bubbles, people flying around. Give it just another minute or two. Let people get back in, because I think I broke everything. <laughs> Oh, 
All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, so question number one, uh, make sure that you're answering as fast as you can, the more points that you get. Question one, during production in 2001, A Space Odyssey had several working titles. Which of these titles was not one of them? Is it Across the Sea of Stars, The Monolith, Tunnel to the Stars, or Earth Escape? And an interesting thing about uh, 2001 is that Stanley Kubrick tried to take a, an insurance policy out that covered for any losses incurred um, if while they were making the movie, intelligent life was discovered and then that made his realistic vision uh, totally fake. So yes, indeed, if you were paying attention before, you might've seen the answer was the monolith uh, coming from the opening scene where uh, there's this gigantic stone monolith that uh, these monkeys attack. Question two. In the movie Gravity, a low earth orbit collision of space debris results in a cascade of subsequent collisions. What is the scenario of catastrophic space junk collisions called? Is it the Kessler syndrome? the Ley effect, the debris field cascade, or the Kepler catastrophe with a K. And now the interesting thing about this is that it was actually first predicted in 1978 and named after NASA scientist Donald J. Kessler. And while he didn't lend his name to the theory, uh, somebody else uh, applied it and brought attention to uh, what his prediction was uh, later on. Very good. So, all right, I wanna take a chance to, let's see who's, who's winning. Looks like in first place, we have St. Elmo, barely edging ahead with that speed. Remember, the faster that you answer, the, uh, the, the more points you're gonna get. So it's really important, not just to be correct, but also fast. Second place, Arad the God, and then big gap between the rest of everybody, Magical Rhino and Tom Diaz. So uh, just for those of you who are tuning in now, uh, thank you for tuning in to Sierra Astronomy Live. Uh, we're just getting started warming up with a little bit of trivia. If you want to play along, please go ahead and, and join. To do that, you're going to go to menti.com, type in the code 25839156. You should see that up in the top of your screen. You'll want to pull it up on your phone so that you can watch on the screen as well. Uh, points are just for bragging rights. So, um, you know, definitely feel free to join halfway through. And uh, after just a couple more questions, we're going to go ahead and get started with the main event for tonight. All right, question three. Which of these renowned physicists served as a science consultant on the popular movie Interstellar? Was it Richard Feynman, Jocelyn Bell Burnell, Vera Rubin, or Kip Thorne? And it turns out that despite their expertise uh, as science advisor, there's actually a small inaccuracy because as it turns out, there's not actually um, time traveling bookshelves at the centers of black holes. And indeed it was Kip Thorne who did not catch that glaring mistake uh, in, in the theory of black holes. Oh, well, we forgive him. Question number four. Which of these science fiction movies features an intrepid band of miners who were sent to blow up an asteroid threatening humanity? Is it Deep Impact, The Day After Tomorrow, Armageddon, or 2012? Now, a fun fact about this movie is that I must have seen it like, I don't know, eight or nine times. I loved this as a kid. Um, however, Michael Bay thinks that this is probably his worst film and is actually on record apologizing for it. And that is indeed Armageddon. So nice job, Bruce Willis, great movie. Definitely recommend it. Michael Bay, not so much. He doesn't recommend it. 
Hasn't apologized for Transformers though. Oh, I think we have quite quite the switch up here. Saint Elmo, fallen from grace. Uh, Arad the God narrowly taking the lead, but then Magical Rhino and Tom VS. I'm proud of you all. This next question, this is going to be make or break. Here we go. The final warm-up trivia question for all of the marbles. The Guardians and Guardians of the Galaxy are not guarding our galaxy. Which galaxy are the Guardians of the Galaxy guarding? Is it the Large Magellanic Cloud, NGC 4993, Centaurus A, or Andromeda? And what's kind of interesting about this is that the fan favorite tree character Groot was not actually named after the much more prominent Illinois-based waste management services, uh, Groot Industries, whose trash trucks can be seen all across the Chicago area. And yes, it is the Andromeda Galaxy. So nice job. Uh, let's see how that worked out for that tight first race, first place race. Oh, Arad the God, you hate to see it. It is Magical Rhino, our first place winner. I'm proud of you. I, I truly, it brings, it brings a tear to my eye. So <clears throat> thank you all again for joining us for Sierra Astronomy Live. Um, I'm gonna take this opportunity to introduce the team, both uh, who you should expect to see in front of the camera and also um, behind the camera. So we are astronomers at Northwestern University, joined by one cameo uh, person uh, from Drexel University, who are here to share with you uh, astronomy, science, space, good times, some trivia. Um, and we're gonna play a game halfway through uh, as well. So please make sure to stick around for that. Um, behind the camera, who you, who you won't see tonight, is uh, Carrie Patterson and uh, Alicia Luco Escorial, um, who are going to be making sure everything runs super smoothly, along with uh, Deanne uh, Copians. So uh, can I get the people in front of the camera to go ahead and turn their cameras on so we can um, introduce you? Great, thank you. So um, I'll go first and then I'll just give it off and, and disappear into the ether. So my name is Alex Gervich. I'm a fifth year graduate student at Northwestern University. And um, when I'm not playing MC Trivia Master, I am using supercomputers to run simulations of galaxies. I can go next. Hi, I'm Genevieve Schroeder. I am a third year PhD student and I study the radio follow-up of gamma ray bursts. I'm Rocco Copians. I'm a postdoc, so a researcher who's got my PhD. Um, I build detectors that search for dark matter. Um, I'm Jillian. I'm a second year PhD student at Northwestern, and I study kelanovi, which are some really cool explosions I'm going to tell you more about later. So, all right. Uh, thank you for, for introducing yourselves. Um, I think Rocco, if you wouldn't mind turning your camera back off, goodbye. We'll see you later. And then um, uh, Genevieve, I will hand it off to you um, and Jillian. Great. Uh, so I will be the interviewer tonight and I will be interviewing Jill Rastinajad and also Rocco Kopians later. Um, so to start this off, we're going to do a couple rapid fire questions for Jill, uh, just to, you know, break the ice, get to know Jill as a person outside of astronomy. And uh, 
Alex, do you have a one minute timer for me? I am ready with the one minute timer. Okay, Jill, are you ready? Do I get a minute to answer? Uh, or... We're answering as many questions as possible in one minute. Okay, okay, I like it, cool. Yeah. yeah. All right, so on your mark, get set, go. Okay, what is your ideal cup of coffee? Black. Okay. What is From your Star <laughs> What is your favorite bad movie? Uh oh, I, I just watched Sex in the City too. It was pretty good. <laughs> Fantastic. What is your favorite meal in Chicago for under ten dollars? Oh, okay. That's a good question. Um I um we went to the uh Bip Bop and Grill in Belmont uh, by the Belmont Rail Station. That was really good. I think it's Korean and style Korean style burgers. They're really yummy. Ooh, nice. I would have said Velvet Taco personally, but good call. Uh, would you rather fight one hundred roach sized bears or one bear sized roach? I hate roaches. The first one. The first one. <laughs> <laughs> that would be terrifying, but fair. Uh, and that's it. That's your minute. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Well, I think that really gave us some insight into who Jill is as a person outside of astronomy. So now I will have Jill give us a little rundown of the type of astronomy research she is currently working on. So Jill, take it away. All right. Thanks, Jen. All right. I'll share screen with everybody. Um, Okay, so I have a little presentation prepared for the type of research that I do, and I'm really excited about it. And hopefully, um, if you guys have questions, you can type them in the chat. Um, I know there's some other experts who are here who can definitely help answer them too. So what I'm gonna be talking about, what my research is about is observing the sources of the universe's heavy elements. And like I mentioned earlier, these sources are actually explosions that are called kilonovae. So just to start it out, here's our universe. So why, why do we know that there's heavy elements on the in the universe is because we actually see them on Earth. So some of these are things that you're really familiar with, like calcium, aluminum, things you might run into on a daily basis. Other things are like hydrogen, which you don't see, but is the most abundant element in the universe, and silicon, which I put here because it's the most abundant element in the Earth's crust. There's other things like oxygen and carbon, which we need for life and for other astronomers who study the beginnings of life, they're really interested in finding those. And then there's these really heavy elements like uh, gold or platinum, things like that, that we don't have in huge amounts here on earth, but we have enough that we can know they exist. So um, one of the questions that the group I'm in is interested in is understanding so why doesn't the universe look like this? Why does our Earth not have this huge abundance of hydrogen? Why doesn't it look like this is much more abundant than other things? Or the reverse, why don't we have huge amounts of gold here on Earth so much that it's just a common thing and we don't even care about it that much? And so the reason is because of stars. And stars, as you might all be familiar with, since I'm guessing you have an interest in astronomy, Stars are what have created all of the elements here on Earth, except for these guys that are here in black. Those were created in the Big Bang. And since then, we've, um, you know, over the past 13 billion years, exploding massive stars, exploding white dwarfs, which are kind of the, the shells of four more stars, merging neutron stars, which are really crazy. And then dying low mass stars have created everything else in between. And so in particular, you know, we're really interested in these heavy elements because supernovae happen all the time. Supernovae are what exploding massive stars are. And so we've been observing for a while that supernovae can create all these elements. But we only recently, like four years ago, observed that neutron stars merge and create all the heavier elements. And so we're still not totally sure that merging neutron stars are even able to produce all of the heavy elements in the abundances that we see here on Earth. But that's something that a lot of us here are actively researching. So um, 
how do these get created? So we have kilonovae. So when you have two neutron stars that merge, you can create this explosion that is so rich in neutrons that you can push enough together that you form really, really heavy nuclei. And these heavy nuclei are what are needed to create the heavy elements that we know we have on Earth. So what do I do? I'm an observational astronomer, which means that I think I get to do the fun part. I get to look at pretty actual pictures of the sky and I get to see how um, the sky changes and how these explosions occur. And from those um, observations, we can look at how much uh, heavy elements are produced and we can look at how they get scattered throughout the universe and where they happen in their galaxies and all these really interesting questions that can tell us about why our Earth is the way that it is. So uh, this is just real quick. Um, one way we do this is we see, we don't actually see, we see neutron stars merge. And so they have this kilonovi explosion. And so the two ways that we know they happen, the first is through gravitational waves. So these are like these gray things that get emitted all around the explosion and they travel through space and time here. And if we're lucky, our gravitational wave detectors are on and we actually detect them. And so we can go looking for the kilonova. Another way we can detect them is through the relativistic jets that they spit out. So these jets carry just immense amounts of energy and that results in gamma rays being produced, which are the most high energy form of light we can get here on earth. So I, both of these ways to look at how uh, kilonovi happen and then I try to get all the observations that I can to study them. And so this actually happened with a recent gamma ray burst that happened last summer. And so I'll play the video. Um, hopefully it's working, <laughs> but you can see that this is actually a really exciting burst because your two neutron stars merge and we think based on our observations that there's a really exciting highly magnetized neutron star or magnetar that formed in the end. So I'll, do I do questions, Jen? <laughs> uh, so I think we're going to just do my questions first and then we'll take some audience questions later while they think about what was so interesting about that presentation. This is a beautiful. Uh, okay, great. By the way, image, video, it's very great. Thanks, Hubble. <laughs> <laughs> so if you okay. want to share your screen, great. Um, so yes, now we will go on to the interview por portion. Um, so Jill, I am your friend, so I know some of this, but to let the audience know, uh, you've had a pretty interesting path that has landed you in Sierra at Northwestern. And I want to talk about that and like what first made you decide to study physics and astronomy when you were in an when you were in undergrad? Yeah, so I, uh, when I went into college, I wanted to be a humanities major. And I thought that I wanted to go and become an immigration lawyer. I actually, when I went into college, I was like, oh, thank God, I don't have to take any more like hard math and science classes anymore. But I had one left to take actually, and it was a physics class. And just by chance, I ended up in a class with physics majors. And I just found that I really liked the problem solving aspect of it. So you used to, when you go to law school, you can do whatever major you want. It's not like med school or something. So I decided to major in physics in addition to a humanities major. And then I just kept going through the physics major thinking, oh, this is hard, but you know what? It's making me a better person. And then my junior year, I was done with my physics classes and I was like, wait, I kind of missed them. And I took this really amazing class in particular, an astronomy class with my first female professor at my undergrad. And she just kind of changed everything to me. And she's still a huge role model to me. And I remember thinking at the time, like, is it real? Like, can I do what she does? And can I be her like when I grow up or whatever? Um, so she just really inspired me. And I had some great mentors in undergrad who were like, no, you can do this. Like you can go. And that um, is how I got here. That is amazing. It's so great to have people that are like role models for you and that like look like you. And, you know, it's great to hear. And we're super happy that you are here. Um, 
<laughs> so as I mentioned, you were uh, also studying human rights. And with that side of your undergrad career path, you went to Costa Rica. Uh, tell us about that experience of like being a double major with physics and also like your study abroad experience. Yeah, so um, something that you all might learn is that it's a little bit tricky to do a study abroad program in college when you're a harder sciences major, unless you go to a school that um, has a good program for combining those two. But um, my undergrad didn't have a great way to do that. And I knew I wanted to do some sort of study abroad thing. And because I had been previously interested in being an immigration lawyer, there is this program that took you to Costa Rica over winter break. And so we did intensive uh, Spanish classes for three weeks. I got to stay with the, just the nicest like host families while I was there. Um, and we also learned about how human rights have developed in Costa Rica. And so we learned about how um, their system of governing is different than ours. We learned about how um, they treat immigrants there and how um, since the country is relatively wealthy compared to the rest of Central America, um, they have pretty similar problems to um, like the American Southwest where they are dealing with an influx of immigrants and they want to treat them properly, but they don't always have the resources to. So it was really interesting to see it from a different perspective. That's so cool. It's yeah, I mean, undergrad is really the time to get those types of experiences. So that's awesome that you're able to do that. And also I was wondering, uh, like, so you did obviously decide on becoming an astronomer, you're pursuing a PhD. Uh, how far along did you get into that process of potentially becoming an immigration lawyer? And then what made you choose like becoming an astronomy PhD instead? Yeah. <laughs> Um, so I had a really crazy summer before I went into my senior year of college because that's when I was, I had lined up an internship for myself at a legal services agency near where my parents live in Boston. And so I went in, I did the internship. And while I was doing the internship, I was also doing last minute studying for the LSAT, the law school admissions test. So I ended up taking the LSAT that summer. I was very serious about doing it. And then I decided that for the month of August, let me just try out doing astronomy research because I had like this great professor at my undergrad who offered to let me do it with him. And so I tried it and then um, I just like loved it immediately. I thought everyone was really nice and encouraging. And I just found that I was just asking so many more questions than I was when I was doing the legal resources things. And I couldn't believe that I could do it, but I got a lot of support. Um, and I never ended up using the LSAT score, but I heard it's good for five years. So I guess I got two more left. We'll see how the next two years go, I guess. That's great. Yeah. I mean, we're very happy that you're here, but it's very cool that you have like this alternate career path that you almost took, in theory, still could take at any time. <laughs> uh, <Hey, Ma>. see. <laughs> so we do, I am saving one of our interview questions for the end because we have a couple good uh, audience questions. So somebody wanted you to explain how do the elements of the kilonova get to somewhere like Earth? And then also... Oh. What is visible from like a home amateur telescope? Are you able to see anything? Okay, yeah, those are great questions. So the first question, how do those elements get scattered in the universe is something that is a very interesting topic of ongoing research. And so whoever's asking that question, you're thinking along the right lines. So that's great. Um, so this is also something that affects supernovae, which are the explosions of massive stars. And so you throw out all this ejecta with all these heavy elements into the universe and it's really, really hot. And so eventually this, uh, we call it dust, cools down enough that it can form new stars. And so when those new stars form, they have disks around them that eventually become planets. 
And so this happens over the course of many, many millions or billions of years, depending on how big your stars are. But it's this whole process of almost like you can think of it as recycling where old stars die and form these elements eventually cool down and then they um, become new stars and those new stars you know maybe even eventually will explode themselves in our in the universe's timeline we're still a pretty young universe I think so would you then, uh, oh, sorry would you say that we are all made of star stuff Oh, Jen, that's so cliche. <laughs> it's fast. <laughs> okay. Um, and then the other one, what can you see with an amateur telescope? Well, if you're in Chicago, the answer is probably not much because you got a lot of light pollution that comes in. Um, but if you're in somewhere like, say, Utah, if you're visiting a national park out in Utah and you look up at the sky, um, even with your naked eyes, sometimes you can see Andromeda, which is a galaxy that's pretty close by. Uh, if you have a telescope, you can get uh, beautiful images of the planets. You can see things like Saturn's rings. You can see a little bit of the structure on Jupiter, which is also really cool. Um, yeah, that's what I would say. But, so we're not likely to see a kilonova from an at-home telescope, right? Oh, I wish a kilonova happened close enough that you could see it with an amateur telescope. Never say never, but um, chances aren't high, unfortunately. Okay. And could you also remind the audience at what wavelengths we observe kilonova? Yes, we observe kilonovae in the optical. So maybe if you had a crazy telescope, you could see it with your eye. And then we also observe it in the near infrared. So that's uh, a little bit redder wavelengths than the optical. Great. Um, I have another question. So when a kilonova is like very far out or do the elements that are created remain more local to where that first occurred? Hmm. Um, so I think when you think of a gamma ray burst, you think of it as really collimated emission. And so you have this kilonova that's kind of surrounding what used to be the star. And then these gamma ray jets come out poking out and they're so tightly collimated and they come out with such energy that they kind of just poke a hole in it and they puncture it and they come out. And so they don't really carry too many of the heavy elements with them. They're mostly just launching a gamma ray burst and getting out of there. Um, but the kilonova are still traveling very quickly, they travel at speeds that are still relativistic, like a third of the speed of light, which just can't even imagine how fast that is. Um, and so they do get scattered pretty quickly relatively to other types of motion that happen in galaxies. Okay, but just because we can see like the gamma ray burst from a faraway galaxy does not mean we're receiving the elements from that gamma ray burst. Uh, unfortunately not. <laughs> It's okay. There's enough that will happen around us that created us. So I think we can yeah. survive without it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, would a kilonova near Earth, like, what would that do to Earth? Like, how would that affect us? <laughs> okay. That's another good question. Um, I don't know. I, I think it, it depends on <laughs> how close it would be to Earth because they talk about what if, you know, Betelgeuse. So I, I compare kilonovae to supernovae sometimes because they're both explosions that carry a lot of heavy elements. Supernovae can be a little bit more powerful than kilonovae, but kilonovae are cooler still. Um, so people talk about what would happen if Betelgeuse, the giant red star we can see in the sky with their naked eye, what if that exploded? Um, and I think it wouldn't affect us too much. We might be able to see it in broad daylight and it might be like, whoa, it's a really bright source up there. But I don't think it would, it's so far away. I don't know if it would affect us at all. I believe with kilonova, mostly with gamma ray bursts, if one is like beamed directly at us too close, I think that's not good. But if we just see the kilonova, I think we're, we're gonna be okay. <laughs> That might be dinosaurs 2.0, but let's hope we don't find out. 
Uh, okay, I believe we have answered a lot of what's been in the chat from the audience. So I would like to finish up this interview by just asking you about who some of your favorite astronomers are and why. Um, so, uh, well, the first one I have to say is that uh, person who taught my classes in undergrad, Kara Battersby, because she is a wonderful supporter. And if anyone goes to the University of Connecticut, just take a class with her because she's just an amazing person and professor. Another person I really admire out of the many that are out there is Vera Rubin, because uh, Vera Rubin was an astronomer who came up at a time when there weren't a lot of women in astronomy. And she, I think it speaks to her passion for the subject that she persevered through that. And she also, which is um, crazy to me as someone who eventually wants to have a family and continue working, is that she raised four kids and she did all this amazing work and also crazy, her um, all of her kids got PhDs too, which I think is funny. Wow, we love strong, powerful, smart women. That me is... too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Jill. This has been a fantastic interview. It's always great to hear how people get into the science that they are doing. Um, I believe we can call Alex back now. Back from the void, indeed. Hi, everybody. Um, so I think we are ready to move into our next event. Thank you for that great uh, interview, both of you. That was so interesting. Um, let's bring Rocco and Jill back online and let's get uh, stumping astronomers. So let me get that up for y'all. So, all right. Hopefully y'all can see now um, the Mentimeter screen for our next portion of the event. So we're gonna be playing five words or less. All right, and the way that this game is played is that y'all are gonna chime in on the YouTube chat and pick a topic in astronomy that you want us to try and explain in five words or less. Now, when I say us, I mean, uh, we'll be challenging Jill, Rocco, and Genevieve, and you will be logging in through Mentimeter to vote on the answers that are your favorite. So, um, the, and we'll be keeping score. And at the end, we'll have, uh, I think we're gonna, we're probably doing five rounds and, um, uh, at the end, we'll uh, count up all the points and uh, declare a winner. So go ahead and log in to um, the Mentimeter app here by going to menti.com and using the code 43165754. Hopefully that works this time. You should see the code up here at the top. And yeah, go ahead and start shouting out uh, topics in the YouTube chat so that we can go ahead for our first round. The contestants will have one minute to come up with their five words or less, and then we will vote on it. And in that minute, you will hear me riff on whatever the topic is. Um, okay, let me just get a timer and then we can announce our topic because I believe it has been chosen to be Hawking radiation. So contestants, you have one minute starting now to explain Hawking radiation in five words or less. Uh, punctuation does not count. You can, the punctuation's free, I'll give it to you. Um, Stephen Hawking, what, what, can, what can you say? What can't you say um, about Stephen Hawking? Um, I will say that I feel like as a pop culture figure, he like really dominated 
you know, people's idea of what a brilliant genius kind of person was, um, for better or worse. And, um, I, but on the other hand, he had some like kind of out there ideas about alien life. You know, he was, he was really worried about like, you know, aliens coming and, and like destroying earth or like robots, you know, gaining sentience. It was, it was kind of a weird thing. You should Google it. Like he they're just, he was, he was very conscious of this. Anyway, that's a minute. So we are ready for our contestants first uh, uh, responses. So Rocco, why don't you hit us with your five words or less? Bye bye, end of darkness, question mark. So that was um, really broken up for me. Um, I hope, can I get maybe an indication whether other people were able to hear that? We got it. Okay, great. Well, you'll hopefully everyone else heard it. Um, okay, uh, Jill, what is your five words or less? Uh, black hole slims down. Yeah, I okay. can't fit more. <laughs> yeah, <Apple>. sure. <laughs> slim fat, slim fast bore black holes. All right, that's mine. I was going to say um, on keto. On keto. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, 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 Genevieve, what's yours? Uh, similar in the vein of Jill. Big hungry guy loses weight. I like it. All right. I like where we're going. Very evocative. So, okay. Now it is your turn to vote for your favorite answer. Now, make sure you're going to rank them. Which one's your first favorite, which one's your second favorite, and which one's your third favorite. And the, the one who scores the most points here is going to get three points towards our scoring. Uh, second place will get two points, and third place will get one point. So make sure to log in to Mentimeter at menti.com using the code 4316-5754 and, uh, and vote. Make your voices heard. I want to give just a little bit more time because I see people are actually logging in still to vote. All right, we seem to have reached a steady state. And for our first round, Jill takes it with Black Hole Slims Down. Uh, second place, Genevieve. We, we, clearly, we like the idea of, of dieting. Um, Rocco, I'm, I'm sorry. But there's always the next round. So uh, go ahead, keep putting your ideas in chat. I see some have already been put in. Let's do, yeah, let's, let's go ahead and do white dwarfs. So, all right, white dwarfs. It's putting on the clock now, you have one minute. White dwarves, what can I say about white dwarves? <laughs> you know, I feel like as a pop culture icon, white dwarves really dominate. <laughs> no. Um, so um, white dwarves are interesting because our son will eventually become a white dwarf. And so for, for us, it's something that, you know, we really want to, to understand because it's, it's kind of close to home, you know, I, I think as, as astronomers, but also because, um, well, I guess by number, most, most stars will become white dwarfs, um, if I'm remembering correctly. And so even though they're very dim um, and small, they're the most important by number. And so, you know, you, 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 should, you should still care about them, even though those O-type stars, those big beefy boys, you know, they're much more exciting when they explode, personally. I, I mean, I guess white dwarfs can explode too sometimes. You need two of them. You, you, they need a friend. All right, with that, my uh, ranting ends. It has been a minute. Rocco, please regale us with your five words or less. Dense hot fire, burn your hair. Dense hot fire, burn your hair. I have six there. Okay, make, make it 
eyebrows instead of your hair. Okay, that is acceptable. All right, Jill, five words or less. Great, happy, dopey, and electron degenerate. <laughs> Uh, that is a that is a much more interesting Disney movie. Um, Genevieve. All right, this is a bit out of the box, but it's what came to mind. Uh, center of the Tootsie Pop. <laughs> I love it. I love these answers. All right, now it is your turn to vote. So I see Genevieve's answer is still updating. Go back. Center of the Tootsie Pop. All right. So hop in to menti.com. Use the code 43165754. Vote for your favorite answer. <laughs> it's a tight race for second. Answers are still coming in though. It's anybody's game. And so for context, white dwarves are, are supported against their own weight by electron degeneracy pressure. So I, I'm really, I, if I could vote, um, I'd be voting for Jill. Sorry, that's, I shouldn't say that. I'm, I'm, I'm skewing the results. Even still, it doesn't look like we have any more votes. Jill, you have taken it again. Rocco, second place. Um, even though you really did come in at six words, that's fine. We're forgiving people here. And Genevieve bringing it up um, the third place, I'm sorry. But there's always time for redemption. So um, in first place, we, uh, so with two rounds, um, unsurprisingly, Jill is leading. Um, and then uh, Genevieve and then Rocco. I mean, I guess I'm surprised. I, I, I feel like shouldn't Jen and Rocco be tied? Um, well, who, who can say? Who, who can say? Uh, yes, now they're tied. Okay, so um, our topic for the next round is going to be Cherenkov radiation. Cherenkov radiation. That's, that's a good one. So I'm starting the timer for a minute. So yeah, Cherenkov radiation. What can one say about Cherenkov radiation? I can make my pop culture joke again, but I'm not gonna do that. Um, Cherenkov, I, I've always been fascinated with Cherenkov radiation. You know, when we first learned about it, my, my professor suggested that it was like the sonic boom of light. Right, and so I just had this 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 vision, you know, in my head of some like Star Trek ship, and I think it didn't help, you know, that Cherenkov kind of reminded me of Chekhov, um, and and then it would just like you know like reach warp speed, and then as it would go, just this you know this boom. So um, it's always been kind of close to my heart, Cherenkov radiation, those that little blue light. Five seconds remaining for our contestants. And that is time. Rocco, bring us back in. Precious, precious water sparkle pretty. <laughs> precious, precious water sparkle pretty. I love it. <laughs> Very important, um, I imagine, for you guys. Uh, Jill, what is your five words or less? Not see but super fast, where C is speed of flight. C is the letter. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, Genevieve? All right. I'm pretty rusty on my physics, so I had to Google this, and therefore I thought that just followed <laughs> on me. So my five words are, what the heck is that? <laughs> I think that that could, you know, really resonate with a lot of our viewers if they'd never heard of Cherenkov radiation. So, you know, you might still be in it. Um, all right. So now it is time for the audience to decide. Hmm. 
Make sure to log in to menti.com. Use the code 4316-5754 to vote. Not receiving a lot of love on what the heck is that? Sorry, Jen. Yeah, and, and Rocco, I hope you will tell us why Cherenkov radiation is precious, precious water sparkle pretty. I'm actually soon. not going to talk about that. Oh, come on. You got to give us just a taste, just a little explanation. We do more interesting things. Well, actually... <laughs> well all right. Uh, I think the, the voting has settled. There is a clear winner. Um, Jill, you are the pro and uh Rocco in second place um coming in with your precious precious sparkling water um and Genevieve bringing up the rear very sorry um I think with that I the the destruction is just too much Jill is is really um taking away with it so um I think we will call it we have a clear winner um and we will move on into our next interview Thank you all, and excellent work. Awesome, thank you, Alex. Uh, so next up, our interview will be with Rocco Kobayans. So we are going to do another round of, we're going to do another round of speed questions. Rocco, there might be a little bit of interference on your end, is everyone's, mics and things off over there? I think so. Okay, sorry, I just hear a little bit of feedback, but. Um, okay, Alex, we have a one minute timer on. I am ready, yeah. And the only thing I could say about the feedback is, is I do also hear it a little bit. Rocco, I don't know if you wanna turn down your computer's audio. I don't know if maybe she's getting picked up by your mic. Is this um, just a thought? I, I don't know. Uh, I'm sure it will be, but I'm ready. Okay, count us down. Oh, oh. right. <laughs> Three, two, one, and go. All right, Rocco, what is your go-to snack if you are hungry and need food right now? Peanut butter sandwich. Me too. Um, what is the best movie that you never want to watch again? I don't remember movie names. <laughs> That's okay. I don't remember actor names. All of them are the same. Um, you can snap your fingers and give one species of animals, other than humans, the power of flight. Which animal do you choose? Cats, obviously. Good call. Good call. Okay. Would you pr prefer knowingly eating chocolate curd ants or accidentally finding a surprise worm in an apple? Chocolate covered ants. Yeah, I think they're like not knowing would get me. Um, okay, how much cat, dog, or pet have you owned in pounds? Or if you want to do kilo, kilos, you can too. In pounds? A lot. <laughs> yeah. okay. A hundred? Oh, wow. We've got a lot of plants. <laughs> oh. I, I said pets, not plants. Oh, in pets? Um, uh, maybe 10? Okay. Very small, very small animals, clearly. That is your minute. <laughs> Lots of plants, not very many pets. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you, Alex, for doing the timing. Thank you, Rocco, for giving us a little insight into your life. Uh, so now let's move on to you talking about the research that you do and giving us some overviews. Sure. So, so yeah, um, what I do is I design and build detectors to search for dark matter. Um, now, what I just want to start off saying, what I'm about to talk about is not just my work, it's all of these people's work. Um, we are the scintillating bubble chamber collaboration. Um, 
and all of these people deserve credit for what I'm about to show. Um, so I think most of the audience will have some idea about dark matter, what it boils down to in simple enough terms for what I'm about to talk about is we see its effects on the scales of galaxies, but we've never been able to detect it in the lab. And what we'd really like to do is be able to detect it in the lab and play with it like we play with protons and neutrons and electrons um, and study it that way. So what I work on is a way to hopefully try and do that. Now on the right is the principle of the detector we're building. This is a phase diagram. What we've got is pressure and temperature. Over here um, in these ranges, you've got a gas. What we do is we take uh, argon and we put it at a temperature and a pressure where it would like to be a liquid. And then we drop the pressure over the phase transition uh, line, which means it would like to be a gas. But in order for it to go from a liquid to a gas, you need to put in a little bit of energy. And the idea is that a dark matter particle, which just like the neutrinos from the sun are streaming through you right now, you feel none of their effect, comes in and very small probability, one of them hits our uh, liquid, our argon, um, puts in a little bit of energy, that makes a little bubble of gas. We can see that gas, that is our signal. Um, it emits a little bit of light that we can also see to get an idea of the amount of energy it put in. And we can listen to the bubble growing. And that is the signal we get out. And then to reset the detector, we increase the pressure again to where the argon would like to be a liquid. And we do that a whole bunch of times. Um, so this is the detector we're currently building out at Fermilab. Um, this thing for scale is about 10 feet high, uh, to give you an idea. It's about the complexity of a car, if you will, um, also in size. And this is what we're doing. So on the left here, you can see our pressure vessel that we've got out at Fermilab. It is suspended from the crane here, and we're test fitting it into our outdoor um, vacuum jacket. So you can see the size of the hardware, look at the size of that ladder that we're building. Um, we've got all of the stuff that goes inside the pressure vessel, the internals, you can see these big glass jars, which we fill with argon, the steel that we use, um, and simulations to make sure that we don't break anything in, well, in ways that we don't want. Uh, we need to control everything. So this is whole bunches of piping and uh, wiring, and we spend an awful lot of time designing and building these things to control the detector um, in the precise way that we need to. Um, we need to be able to look at the cap and look at the bubbles as well, uh, conceptual design, and that's how it ends up looking in reality at the end of it all. Um, We've got three of these, so we can reconstruct the position of where the bubble is in our detector, just like uh, you can, with triangulation, find out exactly where you are on the Earth. Um, I said we need a little bit of light to get some en energy information. This is just some of the bits and pieces uh, that we've made in order to uh, do that. And then last but not least, we also need to listen to the sound of the bubble forming. Um, and this is that those parts and pieces being built. Um, and yeah, that is in a nutshell what I wanted to say. Wow, that's so cool. So like these bubbles make noise in a way, not, I'm assuming humans can't hear this noise, but our detectors can. Yes, um, it is. It is too faint for humans to hear. Also, this, so it happens inside this pressure vessel. And uh, this pressure vessel is at minus 200 something Fahrenheit. So you don't want to stick your ear next to it. And that's why we've got this outer vessel and we pull a vacuum between the two also. So we 
don't look like an icicle, uh, which might be bad and break things. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes. Very cool. Thank you, Rocco, for that overview of your research. It seems very interesting. Um, so I want to take it back a little and talk about your career path getting to Sierra. Uh, so you are originally from South Africa, but you also did your PhD in the Netherlands. And now you're a postdoc here in the United States. So tell me about your experiences in these other countries and what's your favorite part of this? What has been the most difficult challenge you've faced? So there's things I've liked and there's things I've disliked about every place I've lived. Um, and I, I always tell people that if you get a chance, go live in a different country. Um, a lot of times you'll see, it, it gives you a new perspective on the world. It's like people do things differently. It's not necessarily worse and it's not necessarily better, but just differently and it, it works for them. It broadens the person that you are. Um, and it, it makes you realize what you've got and give you a new perspective. Um, challenges, <laughs> there's quite a few of them. I don't enjoy doing taxes on three different continents. I will honestly tell you that. Um, I will say American food, probably not. It, it's nice. <laughs> Um, maybe a little bit too nice at times. Um, so yeah, it, it gives you a perspective on the world and on yourself and it pushes you out of your comfort zone. Um, it reaches a state where you're more not in your comfort zone than you are. And that's the times when I think you grow as a person. Great, thank you, yeah. I mean, having done taxes in just two states inside the US, like I can't imagine trying to do taxes in multiple countries and continents. That sounds exhausting. Um, so in addition to working in three different countries, you've also had four different research fields that you've worked in. And you told us a bit about one of them, but could you give us a little bit of a rundown of what you've done in those other fields? Yep. I've actually, I've got a quick slide on each of them. Um, so what I did for my masters, this was in South Africa at the South African Astronomical Observatory. I was looking at objects beyond Pluto's orbit. Um, and I will say this is what I originally thought I was going to do with my life. Uh, this is the 1.9 meter telescope, I believe that's about 80 inches um, at the Sutherland Observatory. Um, it's about 200 or so miles north of Cape Town. And what my job was is this little thing at the bottom in that electronics box was a new camera uh, that I helped commission, write the user manual for train people on. Uh, when I walked in, we had a camera and we had a box. And when I walked out, people knew how to use it. And the idea there was um, what we did is we looked at objects like comets and other objects in the outer solar system. As they move in front of a star, you get a shadow that kind of gets dragged across the Earth. Um, and by measuring that, you can get an idea of their size, their density, uh, and their various properties. Um, then I moved on to the Netherlands for my PhD. Um, so this is an active galactic nuclei. This is a black hole and there's a galaxy that's about that size around it. And it's feeding, there's material that it's eating and it's launching these massive jets um, that you can see is much bigger than the actual galaxy. So that means you can see them very far into the universe. And my job as a PhD student was, I looked at ways to search for these things and identify them in big surveys because they can tell us a lot about the early universe, about galaxy formation, about uh, black hole physics. Um, yeah, the, the, the work of an astronomer is not always, people see it as looking for a telescope. This is more or less what I dealt with for most of my PhD. Um, after that, I came to Northwestern and I switched gears again. And the idea was 
uh, I was working to develop concepts for new satellite instrumentation, specifically um, the bigger the diameter of your mirror, the more resolution you can have. So the smaller things you can see. So we want to launch really big telescopes, but rockets only have a certain size. And the idea, well, or what I worked on is a concept to develop a mirror that we can fold up. And then once it's in space, deploy it like you would do an umbrella. Um, but then you need to get a very precise surface and getting that is a tricky part. Um, so I worked on a concept of how to do that. Uh, yeah, those are the, that plus the, the dark matter detectors are the four things I've worked on thus far. Awesome. I mean, that's quite a broad experience. And as a radio astronomer, I, I understand the, uh, I guess, struggles of AGN just existing and sometimes being where you don't want them to be because you're trying to look for something else. <laughs> yeah, my problem, there's an awful lot of them. And my problem was there's an awful lot of them that are really close. I was interested in ones where the universe was about 10% of its current age and younger. And finding ways to choose the right ones uh, was the tricky bit. Oh yeah, I, I can imagine. Um, great, thank you. Uh, so for the SBC, you are the project manager, right? Um, and I was wondering how that role is different from like previous research positions. It seems like you've been doing a lot of like engineering throughout all of it, but how has this been different? And what does your day-to-day -day yeah. look like as the project manager? So, yeah, I am not doing what you'd consider a traditional scientist would do at the moment. Um, honestly, it's a lot of engineering. It's a lot of paperwork. It's a lot of safety paperwork. Um, We've got that massive pressure vessel that's full of liquid at minus 200 Fahrenheit um, that we pressurize to 25 atmospheres. And if things go wrong, they will go wrong spectacularly, which is not a good thing. Um, so I do a lot of safety documentation, a lot of spreadsheets, but also we're a big, well, we're a fairly decent sized collaboration with 12 institutes scattered across the United States, Canada, and Mexico. Um, roughly about 30 people working on it actively at a given time. So what I do is, or what a, a lot of what I do is coordinating the work between those different groups, making sure that things arrive when we need them to arrive, making sure that the work that is being done at one institute interfaces with the work at another institute and that we don't have a situation where we bring the two together um, and try and bolt them together and then go, oopsie, that, that doesn't work. <laughs> um, so, and then my job is also just to push the collaboration forward, um, making sure I'm actually one of the few people that work on it full time. Um, Matt, who's helping to answer questions in the comment, is one of the other people. But most people are working on multiple things, as scientists do. Um, and trying to push um, various professors to get more of the time to uh, yeah, get our schedules down to where we'd like them to be. Uh, an interesting challenge that I really enjoy. Yeah, for sure. I mean... Managing people and making sure they're all working together is a different type of difficult than just what you consider typical science. Yes. Yeah. Lots of good work that you are doing. Uh, so I have a audience question that I want to ask before we have our last question for you. Um, so for the SBC, how long does a typical experiment take? Is it just running all the time? Do you like have the on and off times? Um, yeah, so for us, it, it, it depends on what you mean by the experiment. Um, when we get the detector working, it's gonna run for one, maybe two years. Um, of that time, it will be on 
for about 80% of the time. But building that takes a lot more. Um, it's probably order of five years of work for an experiment the size of ours from the point where you start putting in a lot of work. You've got to keep in mind there's still conceptual coming up with the ideas, asking for money um, in order to make it a reality before that. But once you start ser- once you've got money and you start serious work, plus minus five years. Yeah. So are there like ways to uh, like test the parts like or do you just put it together and hope for the best? Oh, no, no. Um, yeah, we, we do a lot of testing. Um, I, I'm very involved in that as well. Uh, so for, for example, um, the things we use to detect the light, they were not intended to be run at the environmental conditions we're running them at. In other words, the temperatures and pressures. But, you know, we can't go and design something, a sensor, brand new um, that will work though. So what we do is we look at something and we go, we think that should be okay. And then we test it and then we see whether it breaks, um, which is a lot of fun. Um, and then if it, you hope, you're hoping it won't break and you can use it, but if it breaks, it's like, okay, this is now a challenge as well. What can I do to stop it from breaking or what can I replace it with? That is cost effective and fits within our scientific requirements and within our uh, design space. It, I mean, uh, a sensor that's a foot by a foot won't work for us, you know. Um, so, yes, we do a lot of testing. The same thing with the cameras. We're running cameras that you have on the back of your cell phone and we're cooling them down and putting them in a vacuum and they're running um and part of it is because we make sure like if they get too cold they start being unhappy so we we heat them up a bit and we break a bunch in order to learn how to do that and then yeah we take it from there yeah it's sometimes crazy to think about how it's more cost efficient to break a bunch of stuff that exists than to make something new (laughs) uh so we do have a bit of a clarification on the uh, the amount of time or but like the amount of time the experiment takes. Um, it, the person said, and I'm going to say ver- verbatim, by experiment, I mean every time there can be an observation like the bubble pop. Um, yes. So what we will do is we will drop the pressure um, to where we could see a bubble. Um, for about 10 minutes, um, and then we will repressurize our system. Um, we, it's worth knowing we, we can have background events as well. Uh, we do an awful lot of work to minimize them, um, but we will be looking for a bubble for about 10 minutes, then we'll, at most, then we'll recompress, allow the chamber to stabilize again, and then repeat the cycle. Awesome. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, I did not understand the question at first, but that makes sense. Thank you. Um, So I'm going to move on to the last question I have for you, but if any more audience ones come up, I will let you know at the end. Uh, What is next for you? What are you going, are you going to be the project manager for the foreseeable future? Are, is your role going to change again since you've jumped around a bit? Yes, um, so I wasn't sure whether I could answer this, but the contracts came through today, so I can now answer that. Um, I will be jumping across the border uh, in October, moving to Canada, where I will be continuing on with my current role. I'm just on the Canadian side of the project. I'll actually (laughs) get even more involved in the project management and the running side of things um, there than I am at the moment. Um, So we're, except for the detector we're building at Fermilab, um, which is mm, about an hour from Chicago, 
Uh, we're also building one at Snow Lab, which is a Canadian national lab. And we're going to go about two miles on the ground in an active nickel mine because we want to get away from uh, the... Um, you've got uh, uh, cosmic showers in the upper atmosphere uh, from cosmic rays, and that creates fundamental particles that gets picked up in our detector. So by going two miles on the ground, you can shield them. And you can imagine building something that's got that much cold liquid above ground. Now imagine doing it two miles on the ground in an active mine. Um, lots more safety concerns there, lot, a lot less room for things to go um, wrong. And also a lot more logistics of just how do you get the thing in there? How do you build it? You're in a mine shaft. Uh, you've only got so much height. We To assemble it, we need 25 feet or so. Um, and we don't have that. So uh, or in, at least in the space where we're going to be living. Um, so we'll, we need to assemble elsewhere and then move the entire thing without breaking things. Um, yeah. Wow. First of all, congrats. That is so cool. Uh, another country to do taxes in, but you know. Yes. Um, I, I will say there's, there's a funny side story to that. Um, after Canada, my wife and I will have lived in five cities on three continents in four different countries. And every time we've moved, we've moved to a colder place. So the question is, how long can this continue? It's got to turn around at some point, right? There's well, not a lot of colder places left. Yeah, when are you moving to Antarctica, huh? <laughs> um, that's really cool. So I have a question about that, though. So you're building in an active mine shaft. Is there any like difficulty with potential like vibrations of like drilling and stuff? Um, yes, they're mining below us and mining means blasting. Um, yes, there is. Um, and there's a lot of risk analysis that go into that. And at some point you go, well, if we get an earthquake or a rock burst above a certain value, um, we're going to lose the detector. And how do we do that in a safe manner without hurting people? Um, so, yeah, it, it's a big consideration. Okay, cool. Um, and I think to round off our interview, we do have one more great question. Why is detecting dark matter so hard? Because we're looking for a needle in a pitch black hockey like football field. There's a lot of place it could be. If you think about, so if you think about the mass of the particle, and if you think about the strength of which it interacts with uh, um, the matter around us. So for example, neutrinos from the sun, there's billions of them going through you right now every second. They come from the sun, but they don't interact with your body. There's, there's a very small chance, but it, it's very infrequent. So if you look at that parameter space of mass versus interaction strength, it's massive. It spans hundreds of orders of magnitude. Um, in actually, in, in uh, mass, it spans 100 orders of magnitude alone. So we need to cover all of that parameter space. And every experiment can only do a certain section of that. Um, there's a lot of dark matter experiments out there. And they're all looking at different sections. And every time one an experiment runs and we say, well, it's not there. So <laughs> let's go looking elsewhere. And we keep on pushing down in order to try and find it. And by doing that, we're pushing the limits of what technology can do. Um, we are developing methods um, in order to do what we want to do. And that is difficult. That means there's spin-offs. There's, you know, this is pushing, this is the cutting edge of science. This is the cutting edge of materials research. Um, 
And that is what we do and we enjoy it. That's, yeah, that's fair. Also like, it's hard to know how to detect something that you, when you don't really know what it is as well. I mean, <laughs> honestly, if we never, well, I hope we, I certainly hope we find it at some point, but we have learned so much about nature and about materials and developed so much technology that is gonna be used everywhere else around us in the process that it's like when we finally find it it'll be the journey will it will be a big question of what is worth the most the finding or the journey yeah and the answer is probably going to be the journey probably well with that very philosophical ending of this interview i think now is a good place to bring Alex back on for some closing remarks. Very few closing remarks. Thank you. Um, that was a great interview. Um, I always love to hear about uh, your journey through this world, Rocco. It's just mind blowing how many different things uh, you've seen and done. I, I, I truly live in awe. Um, that's all that we have for tonight. So um, thank you all for, for tuning in. I'm going to put in the chat um, an email address uh, now. So if there are any thoughts, comments, topics, things you would like to see us talk about here on Sierra Astronomy Live, go ahead, shoot us an email at sierra-events at northwestern.edu. And, um, you know, we can think about how we can make it work. So, you know, when we first started this, uh, this program, we really envisioned it as being something very flexible, um, a place where we could try out new things, play lots of games. Um, so if there's something that you would like to see or you think would be fun, or maybe you've seen somewhere else, uh, please drop it into our inbox and we would be happy to uh, hang out with you all again. So with that, um, I'd like to thank everybody both in front of and behind the camera and uh, call it, I think, a very excellent night. Thank you all.